from London, England, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Q covering Discover 2015. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in London. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube, our flagship program. Where we go out to the events, extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angles. Join Dave Vellante, founder of Wikibon.com. Our next guest is Mitch Goyal, is the senior vice president of GM of the HP Storage Group at HP Enterprise. Welcome back to the Cube. Thank you. The new HPE, same as the old one, but now the official split. 180 days in the job, you came in right at the right time. Um, give us your take on the update with your group. What's happening? What's the new thing? What's hot here at HP Discover? Oh my God, John, I mean, I think it's, uh, timing could not have been better. So, we, there is a massive disruption going on in the industry, as you know. I mean, the transformation from disk to flash. And um, HPE, with its three-part product line and what we have done with flash, is just absolutely the right product at the right time to catch that disruption. So the business has been, storage is a relatively low growth environment right now, but in that environment we have our core product lines that are growing double digit. I mean, you know, three parts growing 29% year over year, <laughs> store once is growing 14% year over year. It's a good time to be at HP Store. Dave always says three parts the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> and at some point, you know, that's going to happen, be mature and be solid to build, base to build on. But the big story here is now this composable infrastructure. Another trend, we're seeing storage kind of playing in, and we're seeing storage kind of sprinkled into the whole composable message. You got hyper-converged, software-defined, all flash, object store, now composable infrastructure. You guys got a lot of stuff going on, you guys are responding to the industry trends. But if you're a customer out there, you got to make sense of all this. How do you talk to customers? What are they saying, what's their vibe? Are they like, whoa, slow down or go faster? Or how do you simplify all this? I, I think there is actually, if we step back, there is a way to uh, put a framework to sort through this madness, right? I mean, as you say, there's so many different questions coming at a storage buyer that's enough to drive anybody crazy. And the simplest way to perhaps sort through it is there is a technology vector and there is a consumption vector. And in the technology vector, there are certain applications and workloads which require a storage system, or system-defined storage, and 3PAR would be a great example of that. There are other applications and workloads where either the application is a shared nothing application, or it's a virtual SAN where that application can run on a software-delivered set of data services which is running on industry servers, et cetera, and that's software-defined. So, those are really the two big design centers in storage now, and that's a new conversation, and then, the customers are having to make a choice of saying, do they want to buy individual piece part storage and integrate it into servers and networking? Or do they buy it as pre-integrated, pre-engineered solutions? So do they buy it as converge infrastructure or do they buy it as hyper-converge appliances? So if you think of that as a two by two and say, do I want system-defined storage or software-defined storage? And do I want to consume it as piece parts that I integrate myself or pre-integrated? I think that pretty much covers the entirety of the choice sets you need to make. So that's the simplification. Yeah. How about deployment? I mean, we're seeing management a challenge in all yeah. this now. What's going on with that piece of it? Is that a technology or consumption, or both? I think that's consumption primarily, right? So, uh, for the last several years, more and more customers are basically saying, listen, I need the vendor community to take on more and more of the ownership of the reducing the complexity of integration. That conversation started with converged infrastructure. I think that conversation is beginning to move to hyper-converged appliances, and the next step of that is hyper-convergence at data center scale or composable infrastructure. So that really is a continuum in that process, and people are liking it. You know, they, they absolutely yeah. benefit from the simplification of ease of deployment, ease of management, ease of troubleshooting. Those are all benefits customers want more and more. So, Thinking about your career, um, you got background from Wharton McKinsey. You saw the you saw the industry split up. Yeah. You, you saw NetApp benefit from that sort of you know destructuring, uh, 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 de-vertical integration, yep. if you will. Yep. A horizontal integration. And, and and what did you learn from all that? And how do you see it changing in going forward? And how will that affect decisions that you think 
Hewlett-Packard Enterprise should make? Yeah, I think there are two big forces going on right now. One is a technology conversation, the other is an industry forces and industry structure conversation. I think the technology conversation is about with storage becoming more and more memory based, compute and storage as a technology stack are coming closer together. So the viable vendors of the future have to have both compute and storage assets to be able to survive. So, which is what you're beginning to see in terms of the industry is moving from best of breed storage vendors to more and more integrated storage vendors, even if the solution is being sold as an integrated appliance or not. I mean, that's a slightly different concept, right? That's the technology force. The industry structure force is a slowing of growth in the external storage market because of cloud consumption, and as is the case in any maturing market, industry consolidation is inevitable. So that is forcing the consolidation of smaller players or lower scale players into larger entities. We saw that in enterprise software as Oracle kind of consolidated that space. We're absolutely beginning to see that in the enterprise hardware space. Yeah, and you're seeing that downward pressure on infrastructure pricing yeah. in hardware and software with open source, you mentioned cloud. You got, you've done some m and in, in your past. Yeah. Uh, you got a new balance sheet to work with. I'm asking everybody what's on your shopping list. I'm not getting many <laughs> answers, but everybody <laughs> seems to have a shopping list. But uh, uh, without getting to specifics, how do you think uh, this changes M&A activity in the industry? Because EMC is a, is a storage company, could buy little you know, things here and there, tuck them in. I mean, VMware is sort of a, an outlier. Even NetApp, you know, you could, it's a pure play. You could do different things, you had flexibility. How does M&A change as the industry sort of reconsolidates? And, and you know, my sense is that when we were in an industry structure where storage vendors were best of breed players, they were constantly looking for the next best of breed technology to tuck in, right? And EMC obviously made a fantastic sort of career out of doing that with the tuck-ins of think, technologies like Clarion, Data Domain, yeah. Isilon, Extreme IO, you name it, right? But that was a, how do I keep enhancing my portfolio because I am the one-stop shop for storage for my customers, and it's okay if I have multiple different uh, solutions. Now the conversation's moving to how do I consolidate at the front end in terms of my customer footprint and because it is now again a maturing industry structure so the Dell EMC merger is a great example of that, right? So Dell EMC merger is essentially saying we're taking a multi tens of billion dollar company combining it with another multi tens of billion dollar company because that's the only way we can get in front of the enterprise customers. So, so you're talking about previously these tuck-ins were TAM expansion. Yeah. And you get to a point where you're, you said storage isn't growing right yeah. now. So you, your TAM expansion comes from mega mergers. That's right. Um, okay, how do you think that affects your decision making uh, as it relates to your organization? I mean, we noticed this year that the, uh, you don't have a lot of experience with HP Discovery, you got one yes. in your back pocket, but you remember they were sort of stovepiped by the way the organization was yeah. structured. And now it's these four you know, customer facing yeah. areas. So how do you think that changes the way in which you guys behave? So for me it's a fascinating sort of uh, difference if you will, because I came from a pure play environment mm. and coming into HPE, the single biggest thing that strikes me is just the sheer customer footprint we have by virtue of the fact that we are the number one server market share leader in the industry. So I don't feel from a storage leadership standpoint that I need to buy other storage companies simply to get more customer footprint because we already have the relationships that we need in every Fortune company, every CIO, we just need to do a better and better job of parlaying our server footprint into broader storage conversations that historically we have not done because as you said, we were siloed organizations and we were really having independent conversations. Oh, so it's phase one is a tach rate. I mean, get that up, right? Absolutely. I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer, yeah. right? <laughs> that's how you expand your, your serve market. Yeah. Uh, but then beyond that, there's yeah. innovation. So that yeah. innovation is going to come from presumably a uh, combination of organic and, and inorganic. Yes. And that's something that HP is now got to prove. Do you yeah. agree that you could take organic innovation and get R&D out to product? What yeah. gives you confidence that HP can do that? I, I think uh, there is HPE, a- HPE, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Interestingly enough, HPE is always, at least in the storage space, had a history of doing a ton of acquisitions. In fact, 3PAR was an acquisition, mm. right? Before that, my, so if I think about our two core platforms, it's based on left-hand networks and store virtual, which was an acquisition, and 3PAR, which was an acquisition, right? So, so there is a mindset I, uh, of if we catch the right technology trend and we believe that it is more efficient for us to buy than build, we will absolutely use the power of our balance sheet to buy. Um, my view of acquisitions always is that any acquisition has to live up to two um, uh, rules, if you will. One is, if I buy a company, do I have the market power that I can significantly expand the sales of that product? To get instant ROI, essentially, right. yeah. Or, if I buy that product, will it help me sell significantly more of my existing products, right? And I think good acquisitions, sort of meet the, those two criteria. It's an and, not an or. Right, the, and the an bad and. acquisitions don't meet that criteria. Yeah. And, and sometimes sort of we get caught up in the technology or the deal and we let our discipline down, which is what we need to be watchful for. Mm. Minish, talk about the growth. You mentioned it's a mature business. Certainly storage is mature. You guys are still growing, even with the three parts. So you're ch taking share, certainly yeah. on the mature market. Different management techniques are involved in mature markets. We all kind of, we know that. But now with the whole, you know, composable, you're seeing a whole nother, I won't say a replacement, but it's an evolution, so it's adding another layer of growth. Yeah. So there's new growth coming in with Agile and DevOps. Yeah. Um, and Cloud. Yeah. What's your vision on that? I mean, that's a growth opportunity. Yeah. What's the innovation strategy and what's your vision? Yeah, I think for the next, for the foreseeable future, I mean, if we take a look at, let's say, 18 to 36 months, we are absolutely, as HPE storage, we are absolutely in a share shift mindset, right? So. There are different strategies, as you said, for when the markets are growing versus when you're taking share. When you're taking share, I, I fundamentally believe customers change only when one of two conditions exist. Either their existing choice is so painful that they have to relieve the pain, or the benefit of the alternative is so compelling that they're willing to pay the cost of change, right? So we have to live up to either of those two, and I believe right now, because of Flash, it is such a disruptive change going on that is forcing customers to change their architectural choices. And their strategic imperatives are driven around apps and embedded data value. Yeah. That's a key driver too. So the industry forces are, that's, that's the winds at your back on that one. Yeah, I mean the transition to an all flash data center, in the business of IT, we can use a lot of the different buzzwords, but ultimately it always boils down to was it cheaper, better, and faster? And Mostly, sometimes you get a value prop which is cheaper, sometimes it's better, sometimes yeah. it's faster. The transition to an all-flash data center simply is cheaper, better, and faster. And so if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the, the value of this all-flash is so great, it's yeah. going to cause people to essentially rip and replace their existing processes, and whether they stay with, say they have an EMC or a NetApp system, they're going to have to change those yes. processes, so that's jump ball and you guys can get in there. Is that, am I, that, am I I'm no, interpreting exactly a lot right. here? But. That's exactly right. In fact, I was having a conversation with a customer yesterday, and we spent a half hour talking about how disruptive it is to bring a new technology, and at the same time, the customer kept saying, and we are going to bring in, bring in all flash. And at some point, we connected the dots of saying, if you're going to bring in all flash, it doesn't matter which vendor you go with, it will be a different technology. So the customers are beginning to internalize that the only way they can get the benefit of all flash is by introducing a new technology, which really gives us a better footing and a better standing than we've ever had. Well, unless they're a three-par yeah. customer. That's the, right, that's the one unique <laughs> And that plays to advantage. Right? Yeah. 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 Maybe is another one, but well, that's the obvious one. That's right. That I can, that's that's, right. that's what of. the growth is, but I got to get back to this question around the growth. So to your point, and the talk this morning you gave in the, one of the, the main theater was um, the end of storage as we know it. Yeah. Or as you know it, it was the actual title. Um, so I got to ask you, we talked about this last time, you know, David Scott had mentioned that you know, it's hard to see the escape velocity of these startups. Yeah. Certainly Pure Storage went public, $3 billion valuation. Um, is there a, will there be a billion dollar storage company solely focused? I mean, you're at NetApp, that was yeah. pretty much, in our mind, the last revenue yeah. billion dollar company. But Pure is a $3 billion valuation, not yeah. doing that kind of revenue. Yeah. Will we see a billion dollar revenue company emerge in revenue growth since NetApp? 
uh, it hasn't happened in the last 23 years, so it's very <laughs> unlikely that's going to happen again, right? I mean, I think there almost are three phases of companies uh, from startup inception to ultimate sort of demise, if you will. And the companies get to roughly, it seems like the VC formula is get to as fast as possible to 100 million so that you can go IPO. And the current private valuations and public valuations are so inflated in the early stages of growth that that gives the early backers a handsome return. But very few companies get to that escape velocity and as you mentioned, only three in the last several years have gotten to that point. It was Nimble, Pure, and, and potentially Nutanix, which is still private, right? But, but they're not doing a billion in revenue. The valuations No, but, no, but they get to 100 over, million and they so get So they get to 100 million in revenue and their valuations are a yeah. Yeah. F amazing multiple, right? But then, as you can see clearly with what happened with Nimble, right? They missed a quarter by eight million and the valuation dropped by a billion. Right, and now that's a multiple deflation of like eight million of revenue. Public markets are very efficient, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. But, uh, so, in the last 20 years, as you've seen, most of the companies, whether it was Compellent, whether it was Ecologic, whether it was 3PAR, whether it was Isilon, whether it was Data Domain, every one of them got to the 250 to 300 million mark and ended up getting picked as becoming a part of somebody yeah. else's portfolio. Yeah, I mean, I see, I mean, I, I just see the, it's an M&A opportunity, but the valuation is so high. I mean, I, what was three par? It was two point something billion. Two point five yeah. billion. And you got pure at three, so that's got a drop. And well, certainly the exit's been there. Liquidity's didn't for the investors, but. Well, yeah. but the difference is today, you don't have the gaps in the flash portfolio for the large companies that you had then in the virtualization side, or in the case of Isilon, EMC's, you know, scale out NAS yeah. gap. Et cetera. And, I mean, and that's much the fundamental question a, is, right? I mean, the, the fundamental question for all the startups is, are they really going after something that's a clear white space? Now, one could argue that in the case of Pure, at the time when the company was founded, yeah. it seemed like it was a white space. They closed fast. Right, <laughs> but they closed fast, Yeah. right? Certain white spaces are harder to close, and NetApp was a great example that even 20 years later, people are still trying to build a compelling NAS solution, and you know, uh, so, so certain advantages are more... Well, VCs are funding Soros, we're seeing some out there, but they're all the go big or go home mentality. Yeah. Something unique that will either hit or not. It's kind yeah. of binary. Well, there yeah. are a lot of storage startups popping up. At VMworld this year, I was yeah. amazed at how many yeah. startups were sort of showcasing their What wares. does that tell us? What does that mean? It's a lot of what money. What it basically <laughs> says is that there's an enormous amount of money looking for ideas. <laughs> okay, so that's one. So back to your talk. So you said in the talk, the era of the monolithic storage is over, or something yeah. to that effect. Yeah. I don't know if that was the exact quote, but that was pretty much uh, your statement. What does that mean? I mean, what does monolithic mean to you? I mean, obviously you talked about Pure, that's a one siloed yeah. company with yeah. all flash, um, but what does monolithic storage mean? What, the, what is that era? Describe that. I mean, I, I may paraphrase that a little bit in terms of saying, I think the era of disk-based storage is over, right? So, we're clearly, just like 30 years ago, we moved from tape-based systems to disk-based systems, we're now beginning to enter in a very rapid transition from disk-based systems to memory-based systems. Now, that has multiple implications. The first phase of it is storage systems will become memory-based systems, like all flash arrays. At some point, memory will continue to get closer and closer to compute, and the unit of infrastructure delivery will become this combined CPU, network, and memory in a single form factor with the right sort of data services, data delivery capabilities. All right. Persistent high bandwidth, uh, high processing power brick. <laughs> that's, that's right, so there is, uh -huh. that's the hardware implication. The application implication is applications are now increasingly being designed in a way that the persistence is being designed into the application layer as opposed to relying on the storage layer. So that's a shift as well. If the persistence is being handled by the application, if the application is relying on shared nothing models, it's relying yeah. on multiple replica models, then storage plays a very different role. Great, right. Manish, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate your insight. I want to give you the final word. Share to the camera and to the audience directly your vision. You've been on the job for 180 days or so. Um, Storage is the center of all the action, not only on the, on the existing business, but in all of the solutions and the transformation areas. It's, it's sprinkled everywhere, obviously, storage is the center of the, of the action. 
Share with the audience your vision going forward. Next three to five years, what you're trying to do for the customers based on their feedback and the direction of the storage group within HP. I think the customers are looking for a single thing, which is how do we complete, begin to deploy solutions that are constantly reducing the ever increasing level of complexity they're dealing with. So the single thing that we are focused on is anything that reduces the customer complexity. At a technology level, it is the transition from a disk-based data center to an all-flash data center. At a uh, delivery level, it is as HP, as Hewlett Packard Enterprise, to be able to deliver compute networking and storage as a single shop solutions, wrapped up with infrastructure software, wrapped up with services, wrapped up with different financing models, so that we can meet whatever customer consumption requirements are there. Nishkar, Senior Vice President, General Manager of Storage Group with HP Enterprise, the new HP Enterprises, of course, is theCUBE. Wrapping it all up here. Day two, we got more interviews coming up. Antonio Neri coming up shortly. Stay tuned, this is theCUBE, we'll be right back. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back.